Bartle for that speech. I want to focus on the innovation-led uh, recovery out of the recession that you just talked about. How concerned are you that the impacts of COVID-19 on Australia's early and mid-career research workforce that we're seeing now might impact on your organisation, CSIRO, and the pipeline of researchers coming into your organisation and also to those companies around Australia that might come up with these great inventions that you're talking about? Look, we're concerned about all Australians, all 25 million of them. Um, we've seen in other countries that social distancing and, and isolation working from home causes an increase in things like domestic violence. And so we're very vigilant on that, particularly with our own workforce, but more broadly for Australia. Um, we've done a lot of interventions to try and better protect our people, take care of them, do more communication and watch very carefully. But what we've seen still is a disproportionate impact on women. Um, and part-time workers and early career researchers because in large organisations these are often the people that are easiest um, to let go early and that's a real problem for our future. Um, one of the aspirations of the missions um, is to be able to find new work for those people in these missions um, as we bring together industry, government and academia to focus our science on getting us out of this recession. And is the government on side with the, the missions that you've pointed out today? Like, is this going to be front and centre of their economic outlook of the October budget? Um, I can't speak to what the budget will do, but we're getting a huge amount of support from pretty much every government department with this idea. All right. Now, I invite uh, our journalists to stand on the cross. Don't touch the microphone, please. Your name and the organisation that you work for, Mike Foley. Uh, Thanks, Dr Marshall, for that address. It's Mike Foley from the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. Uh, last week, you handed to the PM a report he commissioned at the height of the Black Summer bushfires into climate and disaster resilience. And you, uh, CSIRO, called for more funding in science and research, specifically uh, climate and disaster research. And you said that would be a uh, key enabler to build resilience for Australia in response to those climate disasters. But in 2016, CSIRO uh, decided to cut hundreds of staff from its uh, climate and atmosphere and land and water divisions. Uh, I'm just wondering what prompt, what's prompted the new shift in uh, strategy there and if the 2016 cuts were a mistake in hindsight. No, thanks very much for that question. So the 2016 cuts obviously absolutely positioned us in a stronger way to deal with adaptation and mitigation of climate change. And the evidence is clear from everything the organisation has delivered since that time that those were absolutely the right decisions. Now, having said that, any time any person loses their job, it's incredibly sad. And sorrow goes to extraordinary lengths to find a place for our people elsewhere in the organisation. And that too was part of how we're able to deliver amazing solutions like Future Feed that virtually eliminates methane emissions from cattle, the world's third largest producer of emissions. It's how we're able to deliver solutions like grain cast that help farmers reduce the impacts of drought and make better decisions. They were developed by our climate scientists that we moved out of one business unit and put out into agriculture and other areas of industry. And that inspired them to turn their amazing science into amazing solutions. So I'd say they're the outcomes that you can judge us by. But there's been a shift in thinking, has there, in bringing those back, or what, why are you calling for more no. funding? No. Ten years ago, the United States made exactly the same shift, um, where they used to invest a lot of money in measuring and modelling climate, and they made a shift where now 75% of their resources ten years ago shifted to mitigation and adaptation. We know what we have to do, we just have to get on and do it, and that's our challenge. But you called for more funding. Um, I don't believe we call for more funding. I believe we call for more people to focus on this problem in the same way the missions are trying to get our science across the country focused on the things that really matter right now to get us out of this crisis. All right. Thank you. Richard Ferguson. Thank you, Dr Marshall. Richard Ferguson from The Australian. Picking up slightly on Sabra's uh, initial question, the university sector is projecting to lose thousands of research jobs. Group of eight is projecting to lose more than 4,000 alone. And the medical research institutes say that they can't cover those people coming out because their philanthropic donations are, are plummeting. How important is it that we address the funding gap when it comes to university research, which they're negotiating at the minute with the government? And do we face a brain drain if that research funding isn't, isn't given? 
So again, I, I can't speak to decisions that the government may or may not make, but, but, but the, again, the, one of the purposes of the missions, one of the goals, is to rally our research together to solve really big problems. We're already seeing a huge number of companies, both here in Australia and globally, lean into the idea of missions and bring additional funding to bear. If that continues to go in the direction that it's going, then there's a really good opportunity for university researchers to benefit from that, because this is all about co-creation and co-delivery to solve our common problem. Because we're in this together as a country. We've got to dig our way out. Before Jane comes to the microphone, I just want to quiz you too about the, um, as you pointed out, there are a number of Australian institutions working on a vaccine for COVID-19. Uh, overnight, Russia has announced that it's got a, a vaccine and that people are being uh, inoculated with it, despite the fact that there hasn't been a full evaluation of human trials. And President Putin has said his own daughter has received a jab. If you could, if you could line up for a jab, would you take a jab of this Russian vaccine? <laughs> <laughs> so, so Soros looked um, at over 200 vaccine candidates. And when I say we have, we've done it with, in partnership with just about every university and medical institution in this country and globally with CEPI. Um, we chose a small number, again, with CEPI and, and WHO to focus on because, you know, it's like invention. We, we, it's brilliant. we can have brilliant ideas, we can do brilliant inventions, and we think that's 100% or 99% of the effort. But everyone who's built a business knows that the idea is just the first step, and the 99% of the effort is turning the idea into something real. A lot of vaccines fall over, 80% in fact, before they actually get to save lives. We're focused on finding that number of vaccines that really can deliver. Now, because of the collaboration that happened across Australia, we were able to deliver one of the world's fastest animal trials to validate vaccine candidates, and that accelerated them into human trials in the UK and in the US. We need to watch that because if those can deliver, then we will have a solution. We really need to watch that as they go through human trials um, phase two and phase three. But we got them there much faster, I think, than they would have otherwise, and that's fantastic news for the world. That's a really diplomatic sidestep. Is that un-Australian to say, it would be un-Australian to say yes to trying the Russian vaccine? You know, <laughs> having looked at 200 vaccines, I probably trust our people in ACDP to tell me what jab to take, and I probably worried more about the vulnerable people in society having a jab first before I did. And I think all of us would feel the same. And we've got to protect our people. If you're over 70, your risks if you get this disease are incredibly high. If you're in your 50s, they're not so bad. And if you're young, they're much lower. I think we've got to focus on protecting our vulnerable people first and then worry about the rest of us. All right. Jane Norman. Hello, Dr. Marshall. Thanks for your speech today. Jane Norman from the ABC. My question is also about the race for a COVID-19 vaccine. We've seen um, the US and the UK enter commercial arrangements with uh, a few manufacturers to secure supplies to their vaccines should they actually find one, should they develop one. Um, the Australian government appears to be taking a bit more of a wait and see approach in that respect. Should our government be entering commercial arrangements with man vaccine manufacturers um, even though one might not be actually developed or found? Um, so there's some things I can't say, obviously. Um, but I, I would argue that there's two ways to deal with this. You can keep your powder dry and, and get it done and tweet about it once you've done it and people are getting vaccines. Or you can blow your trumpet now and then hope you can deliver later. <laughs> I think the Australian way is just, just, get up, just shut up and do it and... and you know, you can chat about it from the rooftops once you've succeeded. Do you think we will succeed? I'm optimistic. Mm. Annika Smithhurst. Annika Smithhurst from the Sunday Telegraph. Um, thanks for your address. I wanted to ask about uh, what you said about preparing for a pandemic, that scientists did know some warning, you know, did give some warnings that this was a possibility. And given that's the case, did we do enough to prepare? And if this happens again, what can we learn from this time around to prepare for another pandemic? Yeah, so, so we prepare for a lot of things and, and thankfully most of them don't happen. <laughs> so that's, that's good. Um, the, the, the pandemic thing, so again, 10 years ago, the United States recognised that you, 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 you can't talk about doctors on one hand and vets on the other. There was a, used to be a separation between the health of animals and plants and the health of humans. But they recognised a decade ago that they're intimately interconnected. You know, 70% of the diseases that we really worry about come from animals to humans. 
So CSIRO had always been focused on foot and mouth disease, preserving the environment, all that stuff, and we hadn't done that much in human health. We'd done certain things, but not a lot. The thing we did four years ago was really shift over into recognising they're both the same. And then we realised we have actually one of the oldest and largest genetics groups in the country, but they've been focused on engineering crops and optimising for um, drought and, and yield. Those same people, that same smarts, applies equally well to human genetics. And by partnering up with some of the amazing medical researchers in this country, and by far more of them are outside CSIRO than are in it, but by making those partnerships, we're kind of able to bring the best of, of both of us, of each of us together, to really focus on things like pandemics. And that's what woke us up to it. That's why I think we were well prepared. That's why we were able to deliver, I think, the world's fastest animal trial of a, of a, of a vaccine. Andrew Tillett. Uh, Andrew Tillett from the Australian Financial Review. Uh, we saw a few weeks ago the government announced that as part of moves to get encourage younger Australians and Australians in general into studying STEM at university, it's got, they're going to raise the, the price of humanities degrees and things like that. I was just wondering if you think that's a good idea that we're raising the price of humanities degrees. I think education is a traditional strength of our country um, and I was a beneficiary of free education, that's how I got my PhD. Um, there are other ways, there are all manners of way, ways to pay for education and that has to be figured out and again it's an area outside my expertise. But I think our education is one of our key assets as a country. So I think we need to nurture it and, and support it as we go forward because everything that we navigate in the future, these new industries that we're trying to create, STEM is, is a key part of each one of them, and our STEM um, graduations, our STEM enrolments have been declining for years. And worse still, the number of women in STEM has been declining disproportionately to that. So I think we really need to reach out, nurture and support our STEM people, but especially the women who pursue STEM, because if we don't, we're gonna create a future that's the vision of a man in a black suit with a blue tie, not a vision for everybody. But does that come at the expense of humanities degrees? I mean, surely we need critical and creative thinkers as well as, as, as more scientists in lab coats. I look at them as interconnected. Um, so I think, I think the, the power of STEM, the ability to invent new things, comes from our creativity. So I, I see them as, as interconnected. I think education is important in all, in all its aspects to give an informed and, and more balanced public to make good decisions. Before we take our next question, just on, on the COVID um, uh, pandemic, there, uh, across the community there's been this intense interest, at, like press conferences that are being held by chief medical officers and premiers and leaders, it's become appointment viewing for people at home. There's been a, a lot of deep interest in the science that's happening, the epidemiology, the research. Are you hoping that if there is a positive to come out of this, that there might be some young kids who are curious and interested enough now to follow science and be interested in having science, um, getting into science and having degrees as, as a consequence? So, so <clears throat> I'm very hopeful, and we're already seeing kids at unis. We do thousands of, of university and school engagements with students across the country, or we did before COVID. The number of students putting their hands up saying, how do I work in hydrogen or artificial intelligence or the agriculture industry, because it's suddenly exciting again. You've got robots and artificial intelligence reinventing that industry. You, when you see that light in a child's eyes, I mean, that's why I'm optimistic about the future, because we're seeing Australian kids actually wake up, that they're not sort of somehow separated from the rest of the world in some backwater. They're actually right at the centre of the action because of the amazing science that we're doing here. Australia is in the world's top 10 for its science. Trick is, can we get into the world's top 10 for our ability to translate that science? I'm betting we can. Sarah Eisen. Sarah Eisen from the West Australian. Just on industries that might need to revolutionise and transform, we're seeing some labour issues caused by the pandemic, particularly where border issues have been a problem. Um, we're going to have potentially sheep unshorn, fruit unpicked. Do you think there's going to be a need for tech to step up here in terms of AI, in terms of things like that, for longer term solutions? A lot of these problems have been ongoing, will be ongoing. Um, do we need to have more tech taking these kinds of you know, roles to the next level? Um, yes, but not in the way I think you mean it. Um, if you mean tech replacing people's jobs, no, I don't think we should do that. I think, I think a smarter way, and, and ask Toyota who tried to build completely automated factories with no lights, 
that frankly didn't work and they realised they had to bring people in to actually work with the machines so the machines could learn how to actually build a car. There's a lot of lessons like that. So, so machines don't replace people well. Machines can't create knowledge. Machines can't have ideas. And there are some things that humans are just so much better at, but there's things they can do together to make it better. You know, the area that science and technology can help, hey, last time I checked, we're an island, continent, whatever you want to call it. No Australian state created COVID-19. It came from out there. It didn't come from here. And it's here now within our borders. So closing down us to the outside world so we can control it, absolutely. But what we need to do is use science and technology to isolate the hotspots of the virus because the virus doesn't recognise state lines or state borders and exponentials never quite go to zero. So our focus should be not on shutting ourselves down as much as finding where the virus is and focusing our efforts to um, contain it in those areas, in my opinion. Simon Gross. Simon Groves from Canberra IQ. Uh, there's a few science communicators in the audience, both past and present, of which I can include myself. Um, and my question goes to the challenges they face. You talked about uh, uh, the coronavirus being science's moment. It's also the moment for anti-science. From the top down, uh, Presidents Trump and Bolsonaro are pretty, pretty good uh, examples of that. From the bottom up, uh, anti-maskers, um, uh, uh, 5G, you know, blah, blah. And this kind of uh, is a one example. Others are anti-vaxxers, um, climate deniers. Um, so science is not actually winning in terms of getting its message across. Um, do, you have, have, do you have any insight into that problem and any insight into how to solve it? Just sort of bouncing off that point, I mean, climate change, COVID, wearing masks, not wearing masks, they, all these things have become culture wars. How has that been allowed to happen when there are so many smart people around seemingly not going on the front foot to defend these things? <laughs> you got me. <laughs> I don't know where to start there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the platform's yours. Go away. <laughs> I have no idea how to answer that. Sorry. <laughs> Tim Shaw. Thanks, Sabra. Tim Shaw, Director of the National Press Club. Thanks for your address today, Dr Marshall. We talk about um, investment in science. Everyone around the world is looking to scientists right now to solve this COVID uh, nightmare. Can we talk about philanthropy and the investments of independence? We look at what's been happening with the Gates Foundation. We look at the Wellcome Trust. We see from right around the world um, some individuals that have actually said, I can't wait anymore for government. I'm going to talk direct to the scientists. Um, I'd like your response to, is it more than just government investment that we need to encourage? And what you could cite as one of the best philanthropic investments in science that has truly helped the world. So, so I spent my career in the United States and, and philanthropic investments, especially by tech billionaires, is very common there. Um, and in fact, a couple of them have invested in things in CSIRO. Yuri Milner invested in astronomy, for example, because it's a passion for him. And I think it's fabulous when, when people who make a lot of money out of science and technology want to give something back. And Silicon Valley was founded on this idea of pay it forward. But we're starting to see that in Australia too. I mean, people like Andrew Forrest with Mindaroo Foundation really leaning forward to try and give something back and recognise the power of science to transform. The other thing we're seeing is some big companies, because Australian companies historically have been a little risk averse on science and innovation, but to be fair, they've never really tasted the benefit of it the way US companies have. We're starting to see them lean in a lot more to take a bit more risk. And so if the science can meet halfway with the business, and philanthropy can help that happen, I think it's a fabulous thing and we should see more of it. Can you cite the best philanthropic example? Oh, look, we do a huge amount of work with the Gates Foundation and the Wellcome Trust, um, and they're part of the CEPI group as well. Um, the work we did engineering for the Zika virus to engineer a mosquito that, that can't reproduce was funded largely by, by Gates, I believe. Um, so there's a number of really important breakthroughs that, that big philanthropic organisations can drive. And actually, in their own way, they pull together coalitions of the willing. They create missions 
because they have the honeypot to do it, which helps. And they're not politicians. You know, there's a lot of smart people in this country and not all of them are in government. <laughs> Thank you. David Denham. David Denham, Preview Magazine. That was a very good, ex excellent talk. And the coverage of the science was magnificent. But I think there's an elephant in the room, and that's human behavior. And I'd like you to expand a little bit on this particular issue, because it's vital. Other, you see it all around you. Rio Tinto blows up the $46,000 cave. Artif the irrigators extract uh, water with, that they shouldn't. So basically, we seem to have the science to have a sustainable planet, but it's human relationships and human behavior which really are the problem. Do you have any comment, please? Sure. So, so I mentioned the prickly pear, and, and that's one of five major um, environmental interventions that have been made in this country using science in the last 100 years. And, and if you look at Australia relative to other countries, we've been far more successful doing that because when you mess with the environment, it, it really works out well. So, and, and it's not that we've been lucky. I think we've really taken our time and understood it. And um, there's a lady sitting at that table who heads up the entire part of CSIRO that focuses on interventions like that. And one of her secret weapons, um, one of Jane's secret weapons, is social science. Because before we do any intervention, we work with communities on the social science, because often you can solve problems through behavior. Australia leads the world in deployment of rooftop residential solar, not because of any other intervention other than our choice as people. Yes, there were some subsidies early on and so on, but the Australian people chose to reduce our emissions by going solar. It's a fantastic example of how we can take our future into our own hands and make it better. So I think social science, and I think there was a question before about the humanities, social science is such a critical part of how we make these interventions and how we learn how to change and enhance our behaviour to go forward and prosper. So do you think the government did a good thing by doubling the humanities fees at the universities? <laughs> I think that question was already asked and answered, but thank you. <laughs> okay. All right, uh, Mrs Schubert. Dr Marshall, Mr Schubert as a director of the National Press Club, but also declaring for the record, I'm also CEO of Science and Technology Australia. Uh, so thank you for your words about science today. I'm wondering if you might like to offer a few thoughts on Indigenous scientific knowledge in this country uh, and whether you think it uh, has, is, an, is part of that competitive asset uh, in global knowledge systems, but also has intrinsic value and wealth for the country and for all Australians. Yeah, no, absolutely, and thank you for the question. So, so, so we have an active Indigenous science, or a number of Indigenous science programs in CSIRO. Um, but, but I just want to grab hold of one that relates to an earlier question about the um, recovery plan for um, resilience um, and response to bushfires. There's a, there's a fairly big section of that plan that, that talks about the deep Indigenous knowledge of how to better care for our land and to better manage fires. And there is 60,000 years of experience and knowledge there um, that I think we've only just scratched the surface of. And so there's some really deep insights in how we can change our behaviour um, to better protect our people, our property and our land. It's a really important question. Thank you. Thank you. Jane Norman. Hello again. Can I ask you about the vaccine again? Um, given your optimism, I'm wondering how soon... You've seen all of the vaccine candidates, so how soon, realistically, could we expect a COVID-19 vaccine? And I'm also wondering what is behind your optimism, given that we've never found a vaccine for coronavirus, and I think the fastest we've ever found um, a vaccine before, the shortest time frame, is for the mumps, and that took four years. So, yeah, how quick could it happen in this case, and why are you optimistic? So a lot of things have changed since mumps, um, particularly things like artificial intelligence, which can simulate many cycles of laboratory experiments to get you to a to leapfrog you to a faster result. You know, when, when you first asked the question, I said there's some things I can't tell you. That's one of them. <laughs> sorry. Could be like within a year, two I, I just, years. I, I, I'm not allowed to answer that okay. question. I'm sorry. Thanks. All right. Tantalising. Mike Foley. <laughs> 
Sorry. Mike Foley again from the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. Dr Marshall, you spoke about making... I should have talked longer, shouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> this one's maybe a happier topic. Um, you spoke about making the impossible possible and then you went, you know, rattled through some of the um, life-changing, I think it's fair to say, um, interventions that CSIRO's made in technology, Wi-Fi for one, but then, you know, with the introduction of dung beetles and the reduction of flies across the continent as well. Could you nominate for us one of the most prospective areas of technology or science that you think could have a similar impact into the future? So, um, someone mentioned the changes we made in 2016, and there's a young, early career female scientist who was um, uh, one of those changes. And we took her out of uh, oceans and atmosphere and put her into agriculture. And her name's Jackie. And, and Jackie went out on the land and she thought, you know what, I don't know anything about agriculture, but I'm going to convince the farmers that climate change is real. And after three months, um, she didn't convince them that it was real, but they convinced her that there was other things they needed from science. And so Jackie um, created Graincast. Now, Jackie doesn't write code. She had no idea how to create software, but she did understand climate science. And working with that family, she figured out how to use all of her climate knowledge to help them solve the problems that were, they were dealing with on the land. And because she did that, two things happen. <laughs> um, Jackie now heads our climate science center in CSIRO. Um, Jackie is entirely focused on figuring out how can we predict a drought before it hits us and leaning a lot on artificial intelligence to do that. And the family firmly believes in climate change now. I think it's a great outcome. Andrew Tillett. Uh, from the Australian Financial Review again. Thanks um, th for that answer to Mike's question because it's a nice little segue into what I was going to ask you about. One of the missions that you've got in the, uh, that you've announced today is about getting to net zero emissions by um, uh, some time. We've obviously got the situation where a lot of the countries have got targets, goals, ambitions to get there by 2050. The Australian government's position is sometime in the second half of this century. When do you think we need to hit that uh, net zero emissions target by to, um, to meet climate change goals? So, yeah, I, I can't say when we need to, I can say when I think we can do it um, based on our roadmap. Um, and, and the challenge we have though, I think the bigger question is, when is the world going to reduce emissions? Because the world is increasing and Australia is starting to decrease. Um, CSIRO ourselves as an enterprise, we're the second largest landholder in the Commonwealth. Um, the last five years we actually managed to reduce our emissions by about 15%. Prior to that they were going up. Um, so, and, and we did that largely through our own science and technology. It's very hard, um, but we see pathways to do major emissions reductions um, in this decade, not to zero but major reductions, but there's some big science breakthroughs we need to deliver to do that. Hydrogen is one of them. On that note, everybody, please join me in thanking Dr Larry Marshall. Thank you. Thanks. I can see from the feedback on Twitter that there are some people very excited within CSIRO that the missions have now been launched. To say thank you very much for speaking here today, I have uh, the gift of membership here at the Press Club. Oh, so thank you. thank you very much. Well, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.